Okay. We'll begin today's webinar session. I will now turn it over to Todd Honeycutt. Hello, everybody. I'm Todd Honeycutt with Mathematica. I appreciate all of you attending this session. If you could go to the next slide. And now slide three. So today we're presenting findings from the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on VR Practices in Youth. The center is comprised of five partners, Transcend, the Center for Transition and Career Innovations at the University of Maryland, the Institute for Community Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts, the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation and Mathematica, and I've been pleased to be a part of this team over the past five years as we've investigated issues around vocational rehabilitation in youth. The center is funded by the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research under the Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration for Community Living. And I wanna uh, especially thank those members of our technical work group, some of whom are on this call today. Slide four. Today's webinar will summarize our work to date on transition practices, what we've learned on collaboration and partnerships, on VR counselor best practices, on data analytics, as well as specific transition practices. And what we want to do is present our findings around these areas at a fairly high level because we don't have a lot of time, but we do want to point you to further research resources for those who are interested. Now, we've conducted our research at an interesting time. At the same time, or about the same time that uh, we started this center at WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, was passed. And that's really changed the environment for transition, for evidence-based practices, for collaboration. So our work has been uh, particularly relevant in that regard. After we present our key findings, we'll have uh, uh, two individuals offering broad perspectives on the transition field. John Conley from CSABR, uh, who's the Director of Research and Grants, will uh, uh, provide uh, his perspectives, as well as Laura Owens, the President of Transcend. We'll conclude with a question and answer period uh, as uh, individuals uh, present their work. If you have questions, please type them in, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. We have a lot of information in this short amount of time. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues at the Institute for Community Inclusion. Slide five. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Meg Griggle, and I'm joined by Jennifer Seleski. We're gonna share a little bit of information about two studies we conducted um, regarding VR, interaction with higher education institutions that are supporting students with intellectual disability and autism. The first study was looking at a group of projects that were funded under the Office of Post-Secondary Education's TIPSIT initiative. So they were model demonstration projects serving students with intellectual disability and autism. And the second study were four case studies looking at the characteristics of effective partnerships. So as Todd said, this was an interesting time for us to conduct these studies given the context of, of WIOA. And um, so VR is evolving and higher education is opening its doors more and more to students with intellectual disability and autism. So a real good opportunity for us to take a snapshot of what works. I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. Thank you, Meg. So we're gonna hand off a little bit and I'm gonna be mostly talking about the findings from the case study research, which I was the lead researcher on. And um, Meg will be making some connections to the bigger picture and to the um, quantitative research that we did on the tips and model demonstration programs. So we're just gonna be highlighting a few of the key findings around what we found was working well in terms of partnerships between vocational rehabilitation agencies and um, inclusive higher education programs in those four sites that we visited. Just to comment, those were four sites that we selected all across the country. Um, they were in different regions. They involved two and four year colleges. And um, they were sites that were selected as having already strong or effective partnerships with vocational rehabilitation. So when we looked into what the basis was for a strong partnership, we found that 
of these four case study sites, they all had some sort of a existing relationship that the higher education partnership was built on. So three out of four had existing contracts for VR services at the college, um, some of them extending back 15 years or more. And these contracts had been focused on applying on providing employment services or therapies based at the college and then evolved to include a higher education program. All of the programs had some sort of an existing connection that they built on. Meg? Um, one of the things that we saw about these partnerships, because they had existing relationships, they really did have to reframe this new partnership, um, leading them to maybe broaden their scope of intended outcome um, and really grapple with some of the assumptions that both sides may have had about the other's role in these partnerships based on their previous experience. So we, we definitely found that um, the, while the existing partnerships were beneficial, they certainly needed to change in order to make these partnerships effective. Next slide. So I'm gonna pick up again here. Another key finding was that all the partnerships were based on strong sense of shared values, but also understanding each other's goals and processes and how that differed from the other partners. So the shared goal was really being centered on the individual, the student, and supporting their success. Both partners were on board with that, but then they also had an understanding that VR was very focused on employment outcomes. So the colleges needed to keep in mind that they needed to make a clear connection between higher education and employment for the VR agency to be able to really put its support behind the initiative. For the VR people, it was a matter of being more aware of the rhythms and goals of a college uh, campus life. And for example, uh, rearranging the schedules of how they met with students to match up with the semester so that they could be meeting with a student as they were picking their next set of courses, for example, and providing VR counseling at that junction. Yeah, this is Meg again. As they built these shared understanding of each other's goals and processes, that really did take some time. And um, many of the IHEs indicated they had to do some work to help their VR counselors or other contacts in the VR services understand how an academic course load, taking an English class or a poetry class or um, something that isn't directly related to employment on the face of it, actually did enhance students' potential future employment. Um, and that conversation, I would say, is evolving. Um, in some cases, one limitation we found in our quantitative data is that part, programs that partnered with VR, actually VR uh, indicated a preference for more segregated instruction that sounded like the course was more related to employment um, as opposed to uh, an inclusive course that may have sounded more um, like a liberal arts topic. So again, as these programs that were working well together learned more and valued each other's contributions, those seem to change in a positive direction. Next slide. So we had some particularly interesting findings around the role of communication. This was the thing that came up most often when we asked directly what was essential for your successful partnership. It was all about communication. Um, and this included formal communication structures, such as serving on each other's advisory boards, having some sort of a cooperative agreement or memorandum of understanding that uh, set in place the partnership's uh, common purpose and objective, and holding regularly scheduled meetings anywhere from monthly to quarterly to a couple times a year with staff across both partners. But then, um, next slide, please. What was even more important was the daily informal communication. This was really even more essential to an effective partnership. And staff, the ground level staff, like the VR counselors and the staff at the Institute of Higher Education that were directly working with students, were often in contact with each other 
daily or even multiple times a day by phone, by email, by text, keeping in touch as issue, issues arrived and really having that kind of real time connection. And that was really important to the, um, to the success of their work with the students. Next slide. So one of the big aha moments from doing these two studies was how important it was, how, how we collect the data um, really changed what we knew about these collaborations. The, quality, the quantitative data reflected that the TIPSIDs met quarterly or monthly primarily with VR staff. And until we did the case studies where we saw how frequently the informal communication came to be, we really didn't understand the level and the impact of that kind of communication. Next slide. Um, the, oh, sorry, can you go back? Thank you. Um, another lesson learned was really how important um, some structural aspects of these partnerships were. Um, many, in many places, they had dedicated VR counselors that were solely focused on those, the programs. Um, so they had relationships with the staff, they had relationships with the student, they had um, long-term uh, understanding of what the goals and outcomes were going to be. And that seemed to really be um, a primary factor in their success, according to not only the people on the ground, but also the regional and state level VR staff noted that as a, as a positive. Next slide, please. So all of this formal and informal communication, the involvement of dedicated staff really built up a situation where the VR and higher education staff saw themselves as being one team working on behalf of the student. So they came to really have relationships with their teammates across those two entities and roles and <clears throat> feel like <sighs> they were really working together as one group. And that was really important to supporting students and maintaining that communication and uh, coming together whenever challenges arose with a particular student. Next slide, please. So a couple of important aspects of success that came out of the vocational rehabilitation involvement with the higher education programming. One was that support from VR opened up access to higher education to students who were not able to afford it on their own. And this is one of the staff members said, the tuition assistance from VR is just huge. It's been an incredible game changer because it makes inclusive higher education no longer a rich kids club and really opens the door to a much more inclusive possibility. And this kind of equitable access is also backed up by the data from our quantitative survey, which showed that programs that have more partnerships with the stronger partnerships with VR had younger students and a more racially diverse profile of students. Next slide, please. Another area of impact was on the transition process from college to employment. This is another place where that partnership really became essential. Oftentimes, the higher education program would have staff that would support students in their employment experiences while in college, and then there would be some sort of a handoff across the partners during the last year of college so that then the student could hit the ground running in competitive employment upon exit from college. There were clear timelines and expectations of how this was going to happen. And the effect of this can actually be seen in our quantitative data on the student outcomes across programs in that we saw a higher rate of employment at time of exit among VR partnered programs than the rate among those that did not partner with VR. We didn't see the same effect while students were in school, but that is consistent with the qualitative data showing that um, students were more supported by the college. So it's really that involvement of VR at that transition point that makes the student probably more likely to be successful in employment at exit. Next slide. I'll hand it back to Meg. 
Sure. So slide 15. So what we found uh, overall is that VR support for higher ed is really uh, dependent on engagement at multiple levels. At the agency level, they're going to send a message out about how they value higher ed. They're going to set the policies for financial assistance and engagement with their counselors. Um, as well as part of their planning. The regional offices are going to support partnerships through formal contracts, support meeting structures, um, and deal with logistics about counselors being assigned to sites. And then finally, at the counselor level, that's really where um, they can engage with students in their planning, hear more about it. And it really was transformative from what we heard um, for the counselors once they became involved in these programs. Slide 16, please. So just to wrap up, what we find for the implications of these studies is VR counselors um, who were involved really did find it a transformational experience and that really did believe that it enhanced students' employability. And we're seeing emerging evidence across both targeted grants um, and looking at the RSA 911 data overall about the impact of post-secondary education on employment outcomes for students with intellectual disability and autism. But at this point, I wouldn't say it's universal that everyone is supportive of these types of partnerships. I think it is evolving. There's some recent guidance that came out last month regarding this from OSERS, and I think the field is still grappling a little bit with how to interpret and apply this in practice, but I do think it's a really positive and ongoing conversation that we can have about the impact that higher education can have on the outcomes for employment and other quality of life indicators for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn it over to Alan and Rich. Thank you, Meg. Um, slide, uh, next slide, slide 18. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ellen Fabian at the University of Maryland Center for Transition and Career Innovation. Uh, my colleague Rich Lukin and I did these studies, but I am going to be the presenter for, um, for the sake of time. Uh, but both of us will be available to answer any questions that you might have. Um, next slide, 19. Our study was uh, identifying VR counselor effective transition practices. And like everybody else has noted, we did these studies right during in the context of WIOA uh, regulations being um, uh, formulated and um, disseminated. So it was kind of interesting to be right in the middle of that. But uh, this was a two-phase study. Uh, to explore VR counselors' perceptions and preparedness to implement best practices in transition. And the methods for this study, include these studies, I guess I should say, included an online survey and then structured individual interviews. Slide 20 talks about our research questions. Next slide. Um, so two research questions that guided the two phases of the study. Uh, the first are, was, what are the perceptions of state VR agency counselors on transition-related practices regarding their importance and their preparation to perform them? And this was essentially an online survey of 500, uh, we had about 500 uh, SVR, state vocational rehabilitation agency counselor respondents. And then uh, phase two, the research question that guided this study was, uh, what strategies and challenges do a sample of state folk rehab agency counselors identify in, implementa in their implementation of transition practices under WIOA? And for this one, we interviewed about 30 uh, state folk rehab agency counselors. Slide 21, next slide. Um, uh, it goes into our study findings on transition practices. So this, these were the findings from the online survey. Um, and what we found was that all the required transition practices that we had in the survey, and there were 20 of them, they included all five of the pre-employment transition practices, plus several others that we know are very essential to best practices in transition, such as partnerships with LEAs, 
family outreach, career assessments, et cetera. All of those were rated important by our sample of state VR agency counselors who responded. However, the second finding, we did note a significant gap between ratings of how important these counselors identified this transition practice as being to them, to their success and their preparedness to perform that particular practice. We did find the third finding, VR counselors with specialized youth caseloads rated themselves more prepared to deliver all of the transition practices that we assessed, including those pre-employment transition practices. And we concluded in that one of the implications was the need for ongoing training and professional development at the local level to build the capacity of VR counselors and their partners because many of the pre-employment transition services, as well as the other transition practices, involve require partnerships with uh, local provider agencies, uh, local school systems, et cetera. Um, so there was a need for this ongoing training and professional uh, and professional development. Uh, next slide, 20, slide 22, uh, goes into phase two of our VR counselor study. And here we wanted to drill a little bit deeper to understand implementation strategies and some of the barriers encountered by a sample of state VR counselors who were implementing transition practices in their work. And for this, we conducted 30 structured interviews with VR counselors across seven state agencies. So what did we find for phase two? The next slide, the next slide number 23, um, our phase two findings, um, VR counselors identified two key, there were several areas of need, but in kind of homing it down, honing it down for this presentation, we really identified two key areas of training that we think cut across all the counselors that we interviewed, as well as the states. And those were training and family engagement and outreach, how to reach those transitioning students, particularly around the delivery of pre-employment transition services. And then the second, and this really goes along with the first, we believe, is how to develop those partnerships with local school districts, with LEAs, in order to um, coordinate services to deliver what we know are evidence-based practices in transition. Um, another frequently identified barriers to implementation of transition practices. So those were the key areas of need that I just said, the key barriers were and this comes up in many of a lot of the work we do was the lack of availability of well-prepared community rehabilitation providers to deliver effective transition services. Um, and uh, this is, as I said, it's a finding that cuts across a lot of our work. So it wasn't surprising. Some counselors talked about CRPs that were just not prepared to retool their services for transitioning youth and other counselors talked about just the lack of availability, the lack of this resource in the community, and the CRPs were particularly important when we got into talking about the pre-employment transition services of work-based learning experiences. Another barrier that came up that I didn't put in here, um, but that was very important, particularly in the more rural areas, was transportation. And again, the transportation barrier was probably most frequently cited by our sample of state VR counselors in association with work-based learning uh, opportunities in community integrated settings. So what were our takeaways from all of our, from our uh, two-phase study? Slide 24, next slide, 24, talks about what our takeaways were. Um, and there were four major ones that we had. What do we have to do in order to address the gap? Or what do we have to do in order to improve or help improve the delivery of effective or evidence-based transition practices by state VR uh, counselors? Um, one, the first, and I just said this, was to increase and expand access to and capacity of local CRPs to deliver best practices, and particularly, I think, in work-based learning experiences in community integrated settings. A second 
takeaway from this was the need to partner with local school systems in order to tra enhance transition services under IDEA by developing, expanding, and enhancing community integrated work-based learning experiences in diverse settings. This sounds a lot like the first one. I think the differentiation here was counselors often talked and maybe were a little frustrated by when, how to partner with uh, LEA so that they're not supplanting or duplicating transition services, but enhancing student access to these pre-employment transition services and particularly those uh, work-based learning and community integrated settings. A third takeaway, consider specialized VR caseloads to support uh, strong school, family, and community partnerships. We did find that this was a significant relationship. The more specialized the VR counselor caseload was on youth, the more pre prepared they, they reported being able to offer and provide transition practices. And finally, the fourth takeaway was reaching out and engaging students and families in VR uh, via pre-employment transition services. And again, this comes through strong partnerships, through working with local school systems for orienting families of students who are enrolled in secondary schools about the availability of pre-employment transition services, the, the referral and application process to VR, and the benefits really to, to their youth, to their students, including both IEP students, as well as many of the counselors mentioned students of 504 plan students. So the final slide, slide 25, um, I know that this was a very quick summary, but for more information, um, please, uh, please see the recent publication um, in Rehabilitation Research Policy and Education, as well as several reports that are available on the Transcend website. Thank you. I now turn it over to my colleagues at Mathematica, uh, Pervy Sevic and uh, Todd Honeycutt. Thank you, Ellen. This is Pervy Sevak at Mathematica, and I'm going to share today some ROTC resources that can help VR agency staff and staff at other organizations use data analytics to better serve transition age youth. Slide 27, please. So what is the value of data analytics to VR agencies? As Todd mentioned at the start of the webinar, we began our work under this RRTC just after WIOA was passed in 2014. In addition to the emphasis on transition services, WIOA emphasizes performance measurement and evidence-based practices. However, at the time, there was little rigorous evidence to support a variety of evidence-based practices and there was varying capacity at VR agencies. Data analytic tools can help agencies identify effective practices within their own agencies, develop evidence, and inform program and policy changes. One goal that we've had over the past five years is to expand capacity at agencies so that agency staff can engage themselves in evidence building. To that end, our center activities have included learning how VR agencies are using performance management and data analytic tools, providing technical assistance <clears throat> to expand analytic capabilities of agency staff, and developing guides and tools that VR agency staff can use for data analytics. Next slide, 28, please. Why improve data analytic capacity? We know that VR agencies have rich data sources and increasingly so in recent years with the increased reporting requirements. They can draw on these resources, these data using readily accessible software such as Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Sheets. Periodic analyses can help VR agency staff monitor who receives services, who provides services, the characteristics of the youth receiving and not receiving certain services, the costs of services, and changes over time. Staff can use data analytics to compare statistics with their expectations or their state's expectations, to show the effectiveness of specific services and programs, and to apply evidence-based practices. Next slide, 29, please. We view data analytics as part of a continuous program improvement cycle. The cycle I've illustrated here 
uh, which is a cycle with five steps from one through five, begins with step one of identifying problems or questions. The other steps include analyzing data, using findings to implement change, all with the ultimate goal of improving client and agency outcomes. Data analytics provide not just a useful set of tools to analyze data, but also a framework for asking questions about services, programs, and practices. Next slide, please, number 30. One tool that we have shared through the RRTC is the VR Program Evaluation Coach. The coach is one tool that can help agencies evaluate programs and services. In the cycle I just illustrated, it would support step three, conduct analysis to answer questions or address problems. It's accessible without any fee or price. And on the next slide, slide 31, we can see what it looks like. So this slide shows the homepage of the VR Program Evaluation Coach. The visual in the background is an individual walking. And at the center of the homepage is the question, are your agency services having the desired outcomes? And underneath that is a button that says, get started. And that takes the user to a login window where they would just create a login, which again, they can do without any, um, without any charge. Our motivation for designing the VR coach was to provide a tool to help generate evidence that could be put into action. And we wanted it to be approachable. We know that VR agency staff are interested in evaluating their programs and services, but that they are already stretched thin with a lot of competing demands on their time. And so we designed the coach to be as easy as possible without being too time intense. The coach guides users through the entire process of program evaluation, starting with developing a focused evaluation question, thinking through the measures that you want to collect, how to organize data, it conducts the statistical analysis, and at the end, it outputs a short, easy to read, and easy to share report on the findings. Next slide, 32, please. Another resource we have for agencies is a set of three short research briefs on monitoring pre-employment transition services. With WIOA, pre-employment transition services presented a challenge to VR agencies both due to the mandate to expand services to a broader population and because of the spending requirement. Being able to measure services and spending in as close to real time as possible can help agencies see how they and their counselors and providers are addressing this challenge. These three briefs show examples using agencies RSA 911 reports and also more detailed administrative data. Our examples illustrate how to track services, expenditures, differences across the state, differences across providers, and we also propose some performance metrics that agencies can use to track services. In the next two slides, I'll share a small amount of what is in these briefs. This illustration, which is in the first of the three briefs I listed, uses hypothetical data to illustrate one way of examining what types of pre-employment transition services students are getting. In this example, we're asking both what kinds of services are youth receiving and whether this differs across two groups. Students that are just receiving pre-employment transition services, that is pre-eligible youth, versus students that are also receiving VR services, that is students that are VR clients. In this chart, the solid red line shows service receipt among the pre-eligible youth, and the candy cane bar shows service receipt for students that are VR clients. And we can see that there are some similarities and some differences in this example. The top row of bars shows that a roughly equal share of these two groups receive job exploration counseling, about 55%. But then we look across the five services, and we see some differences across services but also between these two groups of students. We see a higher share of pre ex only students receiving workplace readiness training and a higher share of VR clients receiving work-based learning experiences. These are hypothetical data, as I mentioned, and there are no right or wrong answers. But I what I wanted to show here is that even simple Excel-based tabs 
of agency data can reveal patterns that may raise questions for agency staff. There may be a story to tell to explain service delivery, and the data can help you see what that story is. In this hypothetical example, maybe active VR clients are more likely to have work-based learning experiences because the VR agency is able to authorize the additional support services needed for that to happen, like transportation. And maybe workplace readiness training is the most frequently delivered service to pre-eligible youth because the agency has the strongest provider network that can deliver this in groups across schools. And perhaps the low rates of instruction and self-advocacy are expected due to limited provider capacity to provide the services. But the data and the tabulations of the data alert the agency staff that perhaps they should encourage providers to build capacity in this area. Next slide, 34, please. In the third brief that I listed, I mentioned that we proposed some performance metrics to monitor pre-employment transition services. We developed these metrics around three themes, quantity, cost, and access. And for each theme, there's not one singular measure but different measures that may reveal different features that may be of interest to different agencies. And there might be other measures that you can come up with that might be useful as well. We just developed a few. For example, with respect to access, some agencies may be interested in whether there are parts of the state where fewer students are getting services, perhaps because there are fewer providers in those areas. Other agencies may be concerned about differences by race and these different metrics can help address these questions. Next slide, 35, please. So what can you do next? We encourage you to check out the resources I've mentioned today, the VR Program Evaluation Coach, and our series of briefs. And as you do, consider the challenges that your agency is facing and whether you can use data analytics to address those challenges. In doing so, you'll be helping your agencies and your clients, but you'll also be helping others by helping to build the evidence base on practices that improve outcomes for youth with disabilities. Next slide, 36, please. On this slide, I've provided a link to the different resources I mentioned today uh, on data analytics, including, and also some other ones that I didn't mention today. And at the bottom, there's also a link to the Workforce Innovation Technical Assistance Center, WinTech, which provides resources related to pre-employment transition services. Next slide, 37. For more information, please feel free to contact me or my colleague, Todd Honeycutt, and I'm also available at the end of the webinar for questions. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rich Luking from the University of Maryland. Next slide. Thank you, Pervy. Hi, everybody. Um, like uh, the previous presentation by Ellen Fabian, um, only one of us is going to present this, but uh, Ellen was very involved in this project uh, and analysis, as was, I should mention, Todd Honeycutt. Any of the three of us will be able to answer questions at the end as you have them. What I'm going to talk about is a model demonstration project that predated WIOA, um, but it contained many service components that informed what ended up in WIOA. And so we felt that it was worth closely examining the impacts of this project so as to inform effective post-WIOA transition services. So next slide, number 39. Yes, this project um, was called the Maryland Seamless Transition Collaborative, or MSTC, or as we called it, MISTIC. Uh, it had four basic interventions that will um, sound familiar to folks who are familiar with WIOA. Remember, this predates WIOA. But the four of the, the components include work-based experiences, which were informed by a uh, person-centered discovery of student characteristics and interests. And these experiences began in the 10th grade uh, or the third year prior to projected school exit if the student was in a program that wasn't graded or divided by grades. Uh, the second intervention was paid employment. And uh, by grade 12, um, it was the uh, ideal that each participant would have at least one paid employment experience. Also, the project was characterized by early VR agency uh, case initiation 
In fact, uh, the um, VR agencies uh, open cases on the participants uh, as early as 11th grade or the second year prior to projected school exit. And then finally, uh, a key feature of this was the linkages and collaboration of various partners, particularly schools and VR, and of course the CRPs who would be delivering uh, the work-based experiences and paid employment. Uh, so slide 39, please. So the implementation of this project, as I mentioned, predated WIOA. It was led by the Maryland Department of Rehabilitation Services, and it occurred during the years 2007 through 2012 um, with technical assistance from Transcend Incorporated, a nonprofit agency sponsoring this webinar, but also uh, with considerable expertise in the implementation of transition models. It was implemented in uh, 11 of the 24 state, um, 11 of the 24 countywide school districts in the state, um, each with a local interagency team of collabor collaborators. So, not quite one half of all the counties participated. So, it included counties that were small and large, and uh, were urban and, and suburban and rural. So, a, a wide range of uh, demographic variables included here. The participants were any students at the time who were eligible for, for uh, Department of Rehab Services or DOORS, and of course consented to participate. We wanted to enroll at least 400 students um, and, um, and examine uh, the services they received and also their outcomes. Uh, slide 40, please. So the, um, the method of examining uh, the outcomes here was the uh, the review and analysis of administrative case service records just extracted from the DOORS database during the time that the services were provided. And we looked at two groups to compare uh, their outcomes. The first was the all the mystic youth who participated. Uh, in this case, it was not quite 400 because there was some attrition during the course of the project. So we analyzed data on 377 students who participated in the mystic service model. And then we also examined all the youth in all 11 of those counties who received services during the same period. Um, and so uh, the total of youth there was uh, almost 7,000 students. In other words, we compared the youth who received the, the Mystic model services with the, the services and outcomes of those youth who did not participate but were served by VR during the same period in the same counties. So the next slide, please, number 42. So what we found was that uh, compared to the matched comparison uh, group of other VR service recipients in the same counties, the Mystic participants, uh, the services they received included more job training services, more job search assistance, and more uh, on-the-job support services. Um, this makes sense because the focus of the intervention was really to help youth get into work-based experiences and jobs, so it makes sense that they would receive these. Um, and they also received uh, less um, assessment and diagnos diagnosis and treatment services than the, than the comparison group, which makes sense for the same reasons. Um, and in fact, uh, we were able to use those work experiences as, in, in effect, uh, de facto assessment uh, services because that's how we were able to gauge the youth's interest and capabilities and skills and so forth. So um, in essence, the work experiences were the assessment and so they, it was unnecessary for them to receive the kinds of assessment and diagnostic services that were typical of youth who participated in regular VR services at the time. And so um, the next slide, number 42, um, and this is where the rubber really meets the road. I'm mean, excuse me, number 43. Um, this is where the rubber really meets the road. So compared to the um, matched comparison group of other VR service recipients in the same county, Mystic recipients cost less to serve, over $1,000 less on average than those students who participated in re regular VR services. Again, this makes sense from the perspective that there was a collaboration of schools and CRPs and, and uh, VR agencies in the provision of these services, and so there was a um, sharing of resources. And um, also, since work experiences act as kind of a way of identifying students' interests and skills and capabilities and support needs, 
they also required less other kinds of services that might cost VR money because we were learning about the students as part of the intervention itself. But the key finding, and this is really the, the biggest um, and important, most important uh, finding, is that 55% um, of the mystic students were closed as successfully rehabilitated, uh, meaning that they had jobs for more than 90 days uh, when their cases were closed, compared to a, a, a far less number of students, 33% of those in the um, comparison group uh, were closed successfully. This is a, not only is this statistically significant difference between the two groups, but it is a very large difference and suggests the power of work experiences and jobs during the secondary school years for these youth, which supports the, uh, the, the inclusion of these kinds of activities in WIOA, uh, both work experiences and early case initiation of VR services. So if, uh, the next slide, number 44, um, these are some of the implications of uh, what we found here. Um, kind of reiterating what I just said, but the, um, the VR use of work experience category of WIOA pre-employment transition services is likely to lead to um, higher um, employment outcomes. Um, in fact, uh, we might infer from these findings that of the five pre-ed services, work experience is the one that's going to yield the best um, post-school employment outcomes. So what this means is that uh, VR counselors and their service partners need to learn how work experiences are most effectively facilitated, kind of reinforcing what Ellen said earlier about what the counselors expected and what they thought they needed to know. Um, and so this, this points to the need for um, concentrated and focused um, professional development activities. And then the uh, other implication uh, that uh, we, we came uh, up with is that collaboration toward work outcomes, as opposed to collaboration for handing off the service from one entity to another, collaboration between schools and VR and their partners, that, that kind of collaboration maximizes resources um, and improves the likelihood of employment. So again, um, talking about the kind of pre professional development that necessary and capacity building pre and in-service education should emphasize those methods and parameters of collaboration um, so that they can work on behalf of commonly served youth. Um, we have other findings that uh, we, we elaborate on in uh, some of the publications we um, developed as a result of this study. So if you go to the, the slide 45, uh, we, there are two publications I want to point to. One is an article that elaborates in, in great considerable detail about what I just talked about in the Rehabilitation Counseling Bulletin that was published uh, in 2018, last year. And then the other uh, publication uh, was uh, published in 2015 in the Career Development and Transition for Exceptional Individuals Journal, which outlines in, in detail what the service was and what the mystic intervention looked like and, and how the, that intervention used uh, extant research in order to uh, develop this model and then subsequently implement it. So again, these are places where you can get considerably more information about what I was able to impart in, in this very brief time we have. So um, at, with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to Todd Honeycutt. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Rich. I'm going to talk a bit about our findings related to pre-employment transition services. Over the last couple of years, we've been thinking a lot about pre-employment transition services as agencies have been implementing those services. We're curious of, about what they are, how it's changing the service environment for students, who's missed by these services, what outcomes will be achieved both by students and by agencies. And we can't answer all of these questions or maybe any of these questions yet. It's still early, um, but we uh, are thinking about it so that we can answer them someday. Uh, the first step for us is really tracking what agencies are doing, how they're responding to WIOA requirements, what they're, what they're doing. And we've worked with state VR agencies uh, uh, on data analytics, uh, specifically around pre-employment transition services. We've talked with staff about issues they've had. We've held roundtables at conferences. And right now, 
We're in the middle of analyzing program year 2017 RSA 911 data on pre-employment transition service delivery. It's the first year of reporting by agency, so it's a baseline. It gives us a sense of what's going on at the, at the beginning level. Uh, there are a lot of caveats. Uh, with those data, of course, because it's the first year, but even given that, uh, uh, I think they're informative. We don't have those results yet, uh, but look for them by the end of the year. Slide 47. And this slide just covers the basics about pre-employment transition services, which many of you know. There are five required services, such as job exploration counseling and workplace readiness training. VR agencies must spend 15% of their federal funding on these services annually. And the services must be available to all students with disabilities. And by students, uh, that includes high school students and post-secondary education students, typically 14 to 21, but there's some state variation there. Slide 48. And there have been a lot of successes with implement implementation to date. Many agencies are connecting with students who are pre-eligible, that is before they formally apply for VR services. And it's really increased the number of students receiving services from VR agencies. Agencies are providing a range of activities across the five services. They've developed innovative programs, such as summer work experiences. Uh, there have been opportunities to create new or expanded collaborations with local education agencies, workforce agencies, and community providers. Uh, and Ellen and Rich have alluded to that, uh, some of those issues with collaboration. Uh, there have been opportunities to increase monitoring of service delivery. Who's getting those services? Where are they receiving them? What are the differences among providers in how they're uh, offering services? And agencies have conducted statewide needs assessments to determine current service patterns uh, at the school level, at the county level, uh, to identify where the need is for your agencies to step in. Slide 49. But there are also challenges with implementation. Uh, there are concerns about reporting uh, service delivery to RSA. These are services that uh, there, weren't, there wasn't a system to track initially. So how did agencies respond and provide uh, information to RSA regarding uh, pre-employment transition service delivery? There's the issue of quantity versus quality. Um, some agencies, there was just a, uh, an, an investment to spend the 15% uh, without regard for the quality of their services, what's the right way to deliver those services? Who are those right students to receive those services? Issues of state wideness, particularly in, in terms of rural versus urban. We heard a little bit about that earlier. Uh, relationships with local education agencies can be a challenge. It's not simply uh, developing a relationship with the state agency. Each of these LEAs or local education agencies are, are, are independent uh, or in, in a lot of ways. So you have to develop those relationships on a school by school basis. For those students who are pre-eligible, the, there can be a need for additional support services that can't be offered unless they're actually clients. There's the issue of shifting resources to students with disabilities away from the traditional vocational rehabilitation population, working age adults. And across the five service categories, there's overlap in terms of what class of, what's categorized as one versus another. Another item that should be on this list is, uh, and, and we heard about this earlier from Ellen, the capacity of agencies and providers to serve students. That's been a, a, a challenge in some areas. Slide 50. So in terms of what's next, what I posed, posed here are the, the questions that I think face the field. Um, regarding pre-employment transition services. What are the best practices? Agencies are pursuing a lot of different types of activities, types of practices. What are the best ones? What are the ones that get the agencies the results that they're interested in? How effective are pre-employment transition services? What's the outcome uh, for giving these services or offering these services to um, a large number of youth with disabilities? And how best to develop collaborations with local education agencies? As I mentioned, uh, in the next month or, or next couple of months, we'll be coming out with a brief showing agency statistics for pre-ed, um, pre-employment transition services uh, regarding each of the services, the number of students uh, involved, at least in that first program year. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it still feels like we're at the, the base of a mountain. Uh, there's a long way to go. There's a, many steps to take. There are a lot of unknowns, uh, but it represents a, a real interesting opportunity 
uh, for uh, these students with disabilities in terms of the expansion of resources and services. So at this stage, I'd like to remind everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, question and answer box, so that we can answer them uh, at the end of the webinar. And if we can go to slide 51. That's our contact information, slide 52. Now I'd like to hand it off to John Conley of CSABR uh, to give his perspective on the transition environment. John? Well, thank you, Todd. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide some perspectives this afternoon, and, and I just want to thank all the partners in the RRTC. As you can see from the presentations this afternoon, um, they've done a, a tremendous amount of work and developed a lot of good product that can be helpful to both VR agencies and schools and also students with disabilities and families. So really appreciate all the hard work. Um, some things that struck me from, from the presentations um, were that um, partnerships uh, in good communications um, are leading to better outcomes. And partnerships um, in good communications need to be maintained. There are a lot of work. There needs to be a shared focus um, and shared values, um, and also an understanding of each other's goals and processes for there to be an effective partnership. And that's not only at the agency director level, um, but also um, between the, the um, boots on the ground people. So the counselors and their counterparts in the local education agencies and institutions. Um, we certainly need to be cognizant of our providers, community rehab programs. Uh, we need to consider investing in improving the capacity of CRPs, community rehab programs, to deliver transition services and other services. Many of the community rehab programs are not large operations. Um, they don't have the wherewithal, the resources to provide the training to their staff. Um, they sometimes um, deal with large tuner over in their staff. So we need to look at ways that, that we can uh, work with CRPs um, to um, ensure that they have the staff and the, and the knowledge and the capacity to provide the services that RBR customers especially students with disabilities and transition youth need. Um, it's certainly important to engage families and have good partnerships with the local education agencies um, and the counselors um, working with the students need to understand also the importance of working with families, um, ensuring they're a part of the partnership um, and also working with their counterparts uh, in the uh, local education agencies. One thing that is a challenge, and I think was mentioned on one of the slides, is IDEA. Right now, there's somewhat of a disconnect between IDEA and the Rehabilitation Act, which is part of Title IV of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Investment Act. Um, so we're hoping that when IDEA is reauthorized, that those disconnects will be addressed by Congress so that there will be um, more harmony between the two laws to ensure better partnerships. Um, Todd and Pervy, I think, talked about the uh, need to not only gather data, but also um, to analyze it and use it um, both at the agency level and at the counselor level um, to measure the effectiveness of programs and services and to ensure that the, the policies and, and programs that agencies have in place are really achieving the intended results uh, for which those policies and programs were designed. Um, I think uh, Rich and Ellen talked about the need to um, ensure a greater focus on job training and supports and less on assessment and diagnostics 
and they found from their studies that having that greater focus on job training and supports leads to um, better outcomes in terms of employment outcomes and at a lesser cost. So we need to look at that. And in closing these remarks, um, I really appreciate the um, issue of studying the impact of pre-employment transition services. I think we're all, after four years of um, working with pre-employment transition services, finally achieving some comfort levels, finally starting to figure it out. There's still a lot of unknown questions uh, about uh, pre-employment transition services. Uh, and as was pointed out, uh, really what has been the impact of pre-employment transition services and what's the impact not only on um, students with disabilities and um, youth with disabilities, but also on the other, the remainder of the customer base that by law of uh, state VR agencies have to serve. So really looking forward to um, learning more about those, those results. So um, Laura, I'll turn it over to you and thank you. Thank you so much for our research partners, Mathematica, the University of Maryland, and the University of Boston Think College. Um, these studies have been really insightful, and we appreciate their partnership in um, trying to figure out better ways that we can um, advance the employment opportunities for youth with disabilities. Um, I just wanted to sort of sum up some of the things that I heard in the presentations, um, just from a provider perspective. Um, I think that all of these studies have demonstrated what we probably already know, um, that partnerships and effective communication lead to better outcomes for youth with disabilities. Um, I think for us as providers and vocation rehabilitation agencies and local education agencies, it will be really important for us to take a look at the data from these studies to figure out ways that we can better work together, um, better find ways to communicate, um, find a common language uh, that we can all um, agree to uh, so that we can really do our best um, to make sure that youth with disabilities have uh, better post-school outcomes. Um, I think it's really important, um, one of the things that I noted in um, some of the discussions um, from our researchers is that it's important that everybody um, from provider agencies to vocational rehabilitation state agencies to post-secondary education institutions to understand that we're all focused on the same goal. We're all in this together to ensure that youth with disabilities transition from school to employment, um, have some type of career development or career advancement, and most importantly, to empower youth with disabilities to kind of take a look at where they would like to go in their career path. So um, I found that that was really insightful and that it's important for all of us to remember that we are all in this together, that no, we can't do it um, in isolation. And so it's important that we have a united front uh, for our youth and families so that they understand that we're all working together um, to make sure that they have the opportunities for employment and post-secondary education. At the same time, I think that it's important that we understand the inherent differences within the systems themselves. So um, provider organizations have their own systematic issues and differences in how they do things and requirements. Uh, vocational rehabilitation state agencies have their own inherent differences from provider agencies. And then, of course, post-secondary education institutions also have their inherent differences and systems. So it's important to understand that we are all coming to the table um, with strengths and differences. And what we really need to focus on are the strengths that each one of our partner organizations uh, bring to the table to get to our goal of employment for youth with disabilities, including post-secondary education, which leads to career advancement. So finding formal ways to communicate, coming up with um, terminology that is um, is 
equivalent for each of the organizations so that IEP in schools means the same thing as IEP or a similar thing um, in vocational rehabilitation. So understanding that our acronyms and our language might need to, to change or we might need to define that um, for individuals and families and even for ourselves. Um, and, and I thought, uh, again, really importantly throughout the studies is finding ways to formalize our communication, whether that's through scheduled meetings with cohorts, um, provider agencies, voc rehab and post-secondary education institutions, meeting monthly or quarterly, um, creating advisory boards. Um, and, and I think that what I heard in, um, the messaging from our studies was that it's fine to have those um, monthly meetings or quarterly meetings or advisory boards or transition coalitions um, from the, the top down. But it's also important to have those same um, meetings and communications and advisory boards and transition coalitions from the bottom up. So provider agencies, job coaches, employment consultants, vocational rehabilitation counselors, post-secondary education instructors um, should also be meeting to communicate and figure out how we can work together more effectively, as well as from the state perspective. So, you know, the state voc rehab and the state um, Department of Public Instruction um, should be meeting for those interagency um, or memorandums of understanding that most states have, but the implementation is where we really need to kind of follow our practice. Um, one of the findings talked about the lack of availability of well-prepared provider agencies to deliver transition services, and I think that is such a critical issue. Um, there, there can't be that disconnect between school and then provider agencies. And so um, while one of the recommendations was that vocational rehabilitation counselors specialize in working with transition age youth, um, I think from a provider perspective, we should be looking at that as well, that that provider agencies may need to hire employment consultants with specific skills in being able to work effectively with transitioned aged youth and families, because we have to remember that family engagement is critical, but it's often overlooked in the adult system because we're we're dealing with adults. We're working with adults. And so family engagement through our studies um, shows that it's still really important as we transition into the adult world. So finding ways to engage the family. And so if, if provider agencies also have um, employment consultants that can effectively work with transition aid youth, that would be something that I think providers might be able to kind of wrap their, their minds around. Um, and because it is different. And, and I think the studies show that it's different working with the adult system and with adults versus working with transition aid youth transitioning into the adult system. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Sean Roy. I'm with Transcend. And I'm also with the uh, RRTC on VR Practices and Youth. It's been my pleasure over the last few years to be able to work with this wonderful group. And as you could tell, um, a lot of great information has come from it. Um, before we uh, jump into questions, I also want to thank um, John and Laura for uh, being respondents today, giving us their thoughts about the, the findings of the various studies from the field perspective and then from the provider perspective. And Laura, um, recorded her remarks and we were able to play them on the webinar. It was a miracle of technology, so that was kind of fun. Um, for those of you that want more information about what we're doing, if you're intrigued about anything that you heard, most of the studies and the, and the summaries um, are uh, expanded upon through the resources that are on um, our website, which is www.vrpracticesandyouth.org. 
and um, there's a lot of information on that website. So we just wanted to give you a little taste today and tell you what we've been up to, um, give you uh, some recommendations and some thoughts about where things might want to go to be able to improve services, vocational rehabilitation services to transition age youth. And I really want to thank the, um, the, the presenters. So now it's time for some questions. And we do have some questions uh, people have had uh, put in the chat box, but also we've got time. Uh, we have you for another uh, about 20 minutes, and I think that's perfect for us to be able to make additional points or to ask questions. Um, and so, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to see a lot of the questions. My computer is acting up, but Todd has uh, graciously offered to read off a couple of the questions. And Todd, I think the first two that we got may have been aimed towards Meg and Jennifer um, had to do with the inclusive higher education piece. That, that's true. But before we get to that one, there's an easier question to answer. And the question is, will slides be made available from the presentation? And the answer is yes. Um, in your invites, you, there should have been a link uh, to get to the resources. Those resources are also posted on Transcend's website. And this webinar is also being recorded. And so once the recording is available, everybody who's attending will receive a link uh, to get the materials and also the recording. So Meg, this question is for you. When you are speaking the findings across the two studies, are the participants respondents only speaking in reference to students served through TIPSID funded projects and or college students with disabilities who may not be served through TIPSID programs? So um, that's a good question. The, the first study, the quantitative study, was only based on um, data derived from partnerships that were involved in the TIPSID initiative. Just for those who don't know what that is, it's um, a model demonstration project funded by the Office of Postsecondary Education called the Transition Postsecondary Programs for Students with Intellectual Disabilities Program. Um, there are uh, about 93 programs at 90 colleges across the United States that have received TIPSID funding in the past nine years. Um, so the, the quantitative data was looking at VR engagement with IHEs that were hosting TIPSID programs. The qualitative case studies, three out of the four case studies were um, involved TIPSIDs. One was not, had not received TIPSID funding, but they were all supporting students with intellectual disability and autism on their campuses. Meg, the second question for you is, were there any strategies identified that supported, oh no, actually this one's for Ellen, I think. Were there any oh. strategies identified that supported effective linkages to schools? Oh, uh, um, uh, thinking back, <laughs> it caught me a little by surprise. I, I can think of two off the top of my head, and Rich, maybe you can jump in. Um, one was um, some of the counselors mentioned having a uh, having a VR counselor who was assigned to that particular secondary school. Uh, that, as I recall from the data, was mentioned quite a few times. And a second issue that I think came up from our, I'm thinking of our interviews here, uh, was when the uh, VR counselors and the uh, school uh, school district co-sponsored family kind of career fair or transition fair events in the evening. Um, we do that a lot too in, in Maryland through another project, but that was an excellent way of, of reaching out to families as well as kind of cementing that uh, LEA VR partnership. Can you think of any others that you can bring to mind, Rich? Yes, actually, uh, I, I could address that question from the MISTIC study as well. That, that project featured um, regular, uh, regular monthly meetings between the transition partners, VR and schools particularly, and the focus of those meetings was about particular students and their, and their movement toward work experiences and jobs. In other words, they collaborated directly uh, about what might be the best way to get these students in those kinds of situations. So it was 
very effective. It was effective in making sure the students got those experiences because the schools and VR counselors were working very closely with each other and with usually CRPs. And it was also very effective in achieving the outcomes that I illustrated because as you see, way more of the students participating in the MISTIC project uh, were closed, successfully employed than the students in the comparison group. So that, that speaks to the uh, one kind of effective VR school uh, collaboration. Thanks, Ellen and Rich. This next question is for Meg. My system just went out. Hmm. Sorry. Regarding the transition from higher ed to employment, is there an issue around needing to change the BR goal from education to employment? Um, no, I don't. Well, I guess I'd need to know more about what you mean. I think VR's goal is employment. I think the pathway to that goal as part of our work that's emerging is that higher education is becoming a, um, a productive pathway and one that we are beginning to explore in a way that, you know, prior to this past decade, we had not really tried um, using higher education to advance employment for people with other disabilities or without disabilities has been an effective <laughs> um, strategy. And we are just beginning to see how by providing access to um, inclusive education experiences in a higher education setting, coupling that with work-based learning and competitive paid employment while enrolled in college can produce um, long-term good employment outcomes for students with intellectual disability and autism. So I'm, I'm not sure I would say we need to change the goal. I do think some, in some ways it's worthy of us reflecting on the strategies we use to attain that goal. This next question is for Pervy. What are some of the challenges that agencies face with performance metrics or with data analytics? Sure, thank you, Todd. I'd say that the biggest or most frequent challenge that we heard was that of time and not having a lot of time or, or, or feeling like uh, it's not just actual hours in the day, but bandwidth um, because staff have so many other competing responsibilities. Having said that, we did see that there was great interest in measurement, evaluation. And I'd say the next most frequent challenge is aiming to buy and questions, questions that are really challenging. Really challenging. If you're not if on mute, please mute yourself. There's some feedback. Um, so I recommend starting with the low-hanging fruit. Um, something as simple as Microsoft Excel can tabulate data and, and reveal a lot. And so keeping things simple, starting simple, is something that I recommend. And I think a challenge that people face is, is, is there's just so many questions. And, um, and, and, and it's easy to get stuck on, on on the many, many questions and the difficult questions that might be difficult to answer. And we shouldn't let those get in the way of answering the easier questions that, that might help inform, you know, along the way. Thanks, Kirby. The next question is what job exploration looks like. Um, uh, I don't know that I'm the best one to answer this, but it, it's really about the career exploration, trying to figure out what uh, a student wants to do, what their options are. Um, it can be group or individual in, in terms of the sessions. It could be career inventories, understanding the labor market, um, understanding career pathways, uh, those kinds of things. I don't know if anybody else has a better answer for that question. Todd, this is Meg. Um, the practices we've seen for job exploration in the higher education setting 
run the gamut of some of the more traditional work-based learning tryouts, you know, doing a job shadowing experience or doing an informational interview, all the way to having a full, you know, uh, internship, paid or unpaid, ideally paid, um, in an area of interest. Um, the thing that I think we find, especially in the college programs, is often students who think they are interested in a particular area, let's say childcare or um, another thing that they, they're drawn to because they like little kids or they like animals and they have that experience. Um, and then they go and work in a daycare for a semester and they realize that that is really not for them. Um, what we find is that the need to be flexible and responsive and just because somebody said when they were a freshman in their college program that they were interested in a particular area that they are not locked into that. And I think the key word there is exploration with intention and in somewhat time limited. It doesn't take a whole semester to find out you don't like something. So let's not set up experiences that are locked into a particular time frame. Um, if you know within a short period of time that this isn't for you, um, let's let's revisit and find a better use for your time. So um, I think I think there is a lot of potential for uh, vocational rehabilitation counselors and CRP staff to collaborate and discuss. That's where communication really matters. It's not just when things are going well. It's when we need to reboot or refocus our efforts in a different direction. I was going to add that we heard some examples of job exploration counseling that were even earlier or even less involved. They could be done at, at school, hearing, you know, having speakers uh, from different types of jobs talk and um, provide awareness about what different kinds of jobs are. It could include web-based um, modules where students are learning about the different jobs that are out there. And so they're not always on the job um, and they're not always, you know, lengthy experiences. Sometimes it's really a light touch. This next question is for Ellen and Rich. Dr. Fabian shared that phase two of the study included the findings that VR counselors ID two key areas of need in delivery of transition services, with one being family engagement and outreach. Are there any states where there's a particular model that is very effective in addressing this need? Well, that's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I sort of answered that on the last round. Um, I probably, not to toot our own horn, but I think uh, Maryland is one um, because of, uh, primarily because of a different project that uh, called Way to Work Maryland, where it's, a, it's, a, it's an intensive work-based learning experience intervention where we um, really um, uh, work hard, engage our staff as technical assistance experts work hard to engage uh, families with, and in Maryland, our VR agency is DOORS um, and schools. To, so to really, uh, um, really strengthen that partnership. And we do it via some of the things that Rich talked about um, through these interagency collaboration meetings that are in very student and family focused. And then in the other way that I think I mentioned, which are these, um, outreach events that are um, hosted usually by the LEA, our TA staff show up to those and we work very, all of us then um, work um, with families who show up to talk about, and this project again is focused on work-based learning, uh, talk about the benefits of it, the experience, uh, the doors referral and application process for pre -ed. So. Um, so that's the one that comes to mind for me. Hi, this is uh, this is Sean. You know, I can hop in here too. Um, you know, I, I really have been encouraged by the focus of family engagement in uh, some of the comments and the presentations because we know if you're working with young people, you got to work with their families effectively. And you know, the first thing that I always say about that is that you you really can't expect people to do something they haven't been trained to do. And family engagement, we shouldn't assume that people automatically have that aptitude. So some real good staff capacity training, I think, is necessary. Um, we're doing some work in the, in the state of Michigan. Uh, in fact, we uh, 
Transcend authored some parent training curriculum to help spread the word about uh, increasing expectations uh, for inclusive employment for families, but also we, we wrote a professional training session to help uh, professionals improve their ability to partner with uh, families. And so I, I would encourage people to be very intentional about family engagement. Um, assign a point person, do your research, find some people that can do some technical assistance for you. There's, you know, Transcend has, has done some stuff. Uh, there's also the family employment awareness training model or the FEAT model out of the University of Kansas. And um, out of the University of Missouri, Kansas City, they have charting the life course. It's uh, lifecoursetools.com, which are just incredible free open access tools. So there's a lot of emerging materials around family engagement. And it's just a question of uh, agencies and schools and, and programs just kind of embracing the challenge and finding it and, and allocating resources and really doing some capacity building around it. Thanks, Sean. We, we're almost out of time. We have, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and this is for the group. Uh, could you give examples of CRPs that work with secondary school age children, I'm sorry, students, regarding work experiences? All of what I consider CRPs in my area will not work with anyone until age 21 and exited school due to funding. Uh, to me, that sounds like maybe a capacity issue for CRPs in an area. Sean or Ellen or Rich? Sean, I mean, you, you, you've got your own experience, or, or Rich? Well, I can say just quickly before Rich jumps in that, um, you know, the, the seamless transition model, uh, you know, we've been kind of carrying that forward in a few states, and, and what that requires is some core, uh, the core school interagency teams being put together with the CRPs being part of that. Um, so what we are seeing, we're actually seeing both. So whoever posed the question, we are seeing that as well, where the CRPs are saying, no, we don't jump in until much later. But we are seeing in, in some states, you know, we've seen it, uh, certainly seen it in Michigan, um, that uh, there are CRPs when they're invited to be part of interagency teams and participate from the beginning in a real good discovery and assessment person-centered planning process. I think they tend to be part of it a little bit more. I think you also would see a lot more CRP involvement when they're the ones that are contracted to do the pre-ETs in the schools. Um, so if the if the VR counselors are doing pre-ETs, the CRPs might not see their role as is coming in much later. Um, but I would like to hear also what uh, what Priets, um, what what Rich has to say about it. Or not. Um, and Rich, we can, can you hear me? Your line is muted. Uh, you can press start six to unmute your line. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was, the only thing I can add to that is that in some communities it's been necessary to um, create new uh, new CRPs to provide this service because the existing ones either don't want to or don't feel like they have the ability to work with students, and so that has happened in some cases. Well, we've come to the uh, close to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank all of the uh, partners in the RRTC. I want to thank John and Laura as well for being respondents. I want to thank all of you for attending and for your questions. It's been a really nice way for us to summarize uh, our, our project. Remember the website, VR Practices and Youth. You'll get an email with the slides. Go check out the additional resources. Um, there will also be a webinar evaluation that you will get at the end of the session. We'd really appreciate it if you take a minute or two to fill out the evaluation. Let us know how we're doing and let us know if there are any additional things uh, in the future that you would like more webinars or technical assistance and training uh, uh, about. But right now we are sitting at 3.30, so we will end the broadcast. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you the RRTC partners for, for a wonderful project.